Welcome to one more session of Off the Cuff. And our guest today is a minister who's known to be doing a lot in an area where everybody claims to do a lot, but we don't quite know what gets done. The best compliment I have heard from him was from somebody, from a politician, who said that when he presented his first rail budget, halfway through the budget, he said, ye samaj nahi aata ki ye minister kaun si state ka hai. So to that extent, he's brought about a change in the railway ministry. And then he's got rid of the budget. So Suresh Prabhu, welcome to Off the Cup. And partnering me today is Maro Khinayat, a well-known television anchor. So uh, Suresh, in the three years, you've been around in this job for less than three years. Have you delivered as much as you promised? You know, let me interestingly tell you a little short story. I won four Lok Sabha elections. And every election I contested, in the campaign I used to tell people what I've done. I never told them what I'm going to do for them. Of course, the first election was an exception, but I was already in so many organizations before that, so that work was known to them. And people were telling me that you're going to lose the election because you're not promising anything. But I said what we deliver is more important than what we promise. But in this case, it's a railways and therefore we have done a lot in terms of delivering everything that we said in a budget speech. I delivered two budgets. Each of the budget, what was mentioned in that budget speech, has been delivered and action taken report was filed. And in fact, even now, there is no railway budget. This is the third budget which would have been a railway budget, but now it's a merged budget. Despite the budget being merged in the main budget, I presented to the people an action that will be taking in the 1819, uh, sorry, rather 1718, and that also is in public domain. So therefore, exactly what has been done is something which is known. And the reason being that we never promise something which is not deliverable. And we delivered something which we had already promised. So that's what we did. Now, for example, in last three years, we have almost doubled the pace of execution of the project, whether it's electrification, whether it's doubling, whether it's commissioning of new lines, everything has been doubled. And in fact, in the next five years, <coughs> would be doubling everything that has been achieved in the last several decades. For example, electrification is only 42% of the lines today. But in the next five years, we'll double it. And therefore, all actions that are necessary to complete it in the next five years have been initiated. Then all the meter gauge lines will be broad gauge, already sanctioned. So this has been uh, years of legacy which has been taken care of. Thirdly, very interestingly, almost 65% of our networks are totally congested. If you permit, I just give you one number because normally I don't refer to it, but Shekhar is here and some <laughs> distinguished colleagues. So they should not say you said that. 64 years, this is the part of my white paper, which I presented to the parliament. So what we did was, first the white paper, which was like a diagnostic, what is the problem of the railways, and then the second, then the budget. And the budgets are actually addressing the challenges that are mentioned in the white paper. So this is what I'm telling you from the white paper. In the last 64 years, freight loading has grown 1,344 times, 44%. Passenger kilometers by 1,642%. The route kilometers have grown only by 23%. So the problem of railways is that traffic has grown exponentially. We keep giving promises, the point you asked me. And therefore, we wanted to somehow show something. So the best way to symbolize a promise is lay the foundation stone. And luckily, the stones don't speak. So you put them there, they're lying somewhere. And then you can always have another stone, because stones are available plenty, at least for some more time. So we keep doing that. So we said, no, we'll not do that. We'll actually do something. So here, 65% of networks are overstretched, which I just showed you. 65%, operating at more than 100% capacity. So we started doing doubling, tripling where there's a congestion. And in fact, in the last two and a half years, we have sanctioned 16,500 kilometers of doubling or tripling, as opposed to more than just 20,000 over the period of last 70, 75 years. So what we are doing is actually not only delivering what was promised in the budget speech, but addressing the problem that were mentioned in the white paper. Each of the white paper problems, there are quite a few of them. And in fact, this is one booklet which I would, if, if you want, 
their audience, I will share them, I'm putting into my public domain, is what we actually promised and what we have done and what is the clear-cut action plan for the next five years or next ten years, but 2025, because that's a 35 years of India's independence, or rather 22, India's independence, and there, what we'll be doing. So we very clearly mentioned, so I think this is in public domain, so one can compare what, what has been done. Do you, do you miss not having the railway budget? And those, those front pages, the next day with the railway train, freight this, <laughs> fares this, new trains this. You know, yeah. one moment of glory for the rail minister. And you know, wh what I'd rather be happy with is the glory for the railways than the glory for the rail minister for some time. You know, it's always better that we put railways on track properly, let the railways benefit. And if railways are doing well, I think everybody should be happy, including the railway minister. So that's what we are trying to do. Um, Mr. Prabhu, uh, you mentioned that, you know, the kind of deliverables that the railway ministry is showing. Um, does this signify that uh, you have a very hard taskmaster in the Prime Minister? And if that's so, how much of independence and autonomy do the ministers in this current cabinet really have? You know, I'll tell you, and I'm telling you absolutely frankly, the Prime Minister never ever interferes in the day-to-day -day work of the ministry. I'm telling you from my personal experience. He's of course available to you if you need help. You go to him and he's available any time of the day and he can help you to solve a problem if it, there is any. He's always giving total support which is necessary if the prime minister is a political head and that's why prime minister like is the most popular one. So his support is always there but there is no interference and therefore there is a functioning autonomy, but at the same time, he's there. But at the same time, he's obviously, he's the first prime minister who has taken so much of interest in the railways. And he genuinely believes that through the railways, India can develop faster and better. And there is already an example next door. The China has expanded rapidly. Their economy is now $10 trillion. And that has also happened because of, in a way, the transportation sector and that to railways in particular. There's 20,000 kilometers of high-speed railway network in China, which has helped China to connect different locations. China is a bigger country than India. They connect different locations, bring logistic costs down, make it environmentally better, and that means connecting markets. And that's what China has done. So Prime Minister believes that India can actually achieve a higher growth, rate of growth, better regional justice, if we bring railways to the fore. And that's the first prime minister we're talking about railways in this way. And in fact, I don't want to give you numbers and numbers because there are many people who know number better than me. In the last 50 years, consistently the share of investment in the railways has gone down, consistent. And particularly from 1991, where anyway we tried to re reduce the capital expenditure to reduce the fiscal deficit. That's what happened from first five years, 91 to 96. But capital expenditure, which has taken hit, the railways have taken the most hit. And then we did worse, that we invested more in the roads in the previous 25 years than what we invested in the railways. So the railways investment has gone down. The share of traffic on railways, though the modal traffic might have gone down, but the numbers have gone up so much. And the result is what the railways are today. So if you want to correct it, you have to make investment. And therefore the first government, which has stepped up investment in the railways, <coughs> significant. For example, we used to invest something like if you take last 10 years average, something in the region of 35, 38,000 crores a year. In the first two and a half years, our commitment to capital expenditure is almost 350,000 crores. And that is, that shows... But, but can you sp spend it? Is, yep. the, is the pipeline available to spend it? Yes. In fact, some people have num doubt about the numbers, but I will have the clear clear about how we have spent it. If somebody wants to come to the office with our CAG, etc., we can actually help them to do that. <laughs> but we actually spent it, yes. No, but you mentioned that uh, this prime minister in particular is taking a lot of interest in railways, right? Uh, we see all achievements with just one face, with that of the prime minister. Is it that the other ministers are so busy working like you are, or is it that a diktat has been given for the other ministers to keep mum? That shows the popularity of the prime minister, that people hear him more. <laughs> That's what you're asking me this question. <laughs> and therefore, you are absolutely right in saying that. Because even on your, <laughs> even on your uh, presentation, we, on the, other side, I see the Prime Minister's picture, not yours. No, obviously, because <laughs> the Prime Minister, what, you know, just look at it, honestly. Why is the, in a democracy, 
you go to poll with a leader leading it. The UK Prime Minister May is now is the person who called the election and she's going for a <coughs> snap election. Anywhere in the world, there's a Trump that, of course, the presidential election, but even in a democracy. Even in Japan, you go to Abe is the election. So what was the face of 2014 election? It was Narendra Modi. So people have voted for Narendra Modi. People have said that government headed by Narendra Modi. But people obviously know that there are going to be other ministers, there are other leaders, and party has so many leaders, like BJP has so many leaders. But prime minister is the one. So therefore, it is absolutely logical that power that the government enjoys is power from the people <coughs> who have been given to the leader of uh, the, the, the leader of the government is prime minister, so obviously it is. So, so tell us a secret. What did the prime minister tell you when he invited you to handle the railway ministry? And who, when he invited you to the BJP, because you were not in the BJP until recently. Prime minister, of course, he, when I, I didn't contest the last election. Right. So prime minister made me the Sherpa, G20 Sherpa with the cabinet minister rank. And that was a position I was handling. When one day he told me that I had to be a minister, I didn't know that I'm a railway minister. Then, of course, I became a member of parliament uh, through Haryana, and now he told me. So, only thing he told me is that this is a very challenging responsibility, and railways can really transform India over a period of time. So, let us put it into this, and let us shun populism and work on real issues that the railway is facing today. And that's what we are trying to do in the last two and a half years. That I'm in, the government is three years, I'm in office for two and a half years that what is good for the railways, we should do it. In fact, you mentioned the budget that I presented and people said we don't know who the minister is from which state. The several experts in the railways told me that is a first budget for the railways. So this is what we are trying to do, is work for the railways. And then railways will properly be taken care of. If you work for the railways, railways will run properly. But Mr. Prabhu, you've also worked with uh, Mr. Vajpayee. What is different in the working styles of the two BJP prime ministers? They are two different individuals. Both are completely nationalist. They are the ones who believe in the growth of India. And in fact, first time when you saw the first India government, Atalji's government, there was so much of thrust on infrastructure. So that government was also focusing on future of India. This prime minister again is focusing on future of India, making huge investment to infrastructure. And this time, the first India government, at least there was a private sector investment which was coming in. Because of legacy that this government has inherited, there is hardly any private sector investment coming in. And despite that, we have been able to push the growth. So I think the Prime Minister of India, uh, the, both the Prime Ministers, always focused on India, focused on growth, focused on equity, finding out how India will benefit. But both had different individuals, so therefore different styles. So, so, so Tell us a couple of lines about each other's style, because both of them like you. I mean, both of them like you, that we know. Yeah, both are, you know, other, honestly, they're two separate individuals, so it's very difficult to say that how, they're different individuals, so therefore different style. But both had something in common, which I said, that love for India, trying to suit something for the country. So that's something which is quite a... You remember something from the conversation with Mr. Vajpayee? No, no, many times, you know, in fact, I was very lucky, he treated me like his son. And with, as you told me, when I was asked to resign, then Prime Minister Vajpayee got me back immediately. Right. In the next few days, he said, I cannot get, cannot even reconcile to the fact that you are not in the cabinet. So he got me as, as soon as possible. So I think he was one of our, like a father, even today he's like a father to me. But he's a, and of course, visionary, thought differently, very firm. When we did the uh, Pokhran too, he knew that the consequences will follow. Economic situation may be challenging, but he still did it because he said India needs it. And conversation with Mr. Modi that you'd like to share with us without betraying cabinet secret? <laughs> no, no. See, Prime Minister Modi is very clear. And in fact, there is one good thing about Prime Minister is that whatever he's, as you said, you hear him more and you speak. So he has spoken his mind out very clearly. And that's what he believes. What he says in public domain is something which he wants to implement in a, his day-to-day -day life. He believes, in fact, I don't know any prime minister, any person who could work like this. Because you on TV, all media have been covering him ever since he became, before that also, but ever since he was appointed, the, the NDA chose him as a candidate for prime minister. Since then, for the last three and a half years, he has not taken a day's off. And every day's schedule is, if you look at it, it is so challenging. So what he's trying to put in, it's something 
just setting an example. So someone like him is working so much. I think we, even if you work little bit as much as he's doing, probably India will be do a better job. That's what we are trying to do.